Hello board game brothers and sisters, I'm Adam Singer and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of all the board games launching this week. And if you're new to the channel, we do this every week going over all the upcoming campaigns. But before we get started, let's check out some new announcements and discoveries I just found out about over the past week. I don't have too many to go over here, but I do have a couple updated launch dates. So the first one is for Dead Cells, which is a board game based on the video game with the same name. So if you're a fan of the series or if you're a fan of roguelike games, this might be one that you want to check out. And this one's going to be launching on May 16th. And of course, I will be covering this in more detail during the week of its launch. So if you want to know more, make sure to subscribe and I will cover you in that week. And we also have a launch date for the Miniatures of Gloomhaven campaign. And this is going to be offering you miniatures to replace all the standees in Gloomhaven or Frosthaven. And you'll also be able to use them in the new Gloomhaven RPG, which is also going to be offered in this campaign. I think they're also going to be doing a reprint of Frosthaven and possibly Gloomhaven. I don't know for sure if they're going to be offering any sort of discount for bundling the miniatures and the actual games together, so you might want to wait until the campaign launches before you make any decisions on that. But this one will be launching June 20th, even though it doesn't have a date on their backer kit page yet. Somehow I have information that it's launching on June 20th, and if that date changes, I will of course update you. Otherwise, I'll be covering this in more detail in the week of its launch. And if you're a fan of the board game mosaics that I show at the end of each and every one of these videos, or if you didn't know that I show a mosaic at the end of each and every one of these videos, you should stay until the end and check them out because they look really cool and you'll be excited about it and you'll probably be interested in this campaign because Katya Houtson is doing all the heavy lifting here because she is the one that makes those board game mosaics and she's going to be launching a campaign very shortly where you'll be able to purchase some board game mosaic calendars that feature all sorts of her artwork and there'll also be all sorts of other items related to these board game mosaics that you'll definitely want to check out. I don't have a launch date for this one but I will let you know as soon as she lets me know and of course feel free to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of this and finally i did mention that i will be attending the level up retreat here in july over in connecticut and this is going to be hosted by alex radcliffe and there's going to be a ton of content creators and people in the community that will be a lot of fun to hang out with and a lot of fun to play games with so if you are in the area definitely check it out or try to make it out to the area so we can play some games together because i'm super excited for this one and I did recently just officially get involved with it. I don't know exactly what I'll be doing yet, but I'll figure out something fun and I hope you're there to take part. But now that I do have these special privileges, they did give me a discount code that any of you can use to get $10 off any ticket purchase. So if you are planning on going or if you're thinking about it, definitely check it out and you can go ahead and just use the games for everyone coupon code and that will give you $10 off your total when you go to check out. And I really do mean it when I say that I hope I see you there. So if you are going and you want to hang out or play a game or anything like that, feel free to message me on the Discord and I'll do my best to meet up. But that's it for an intro, so let's check out the campaigns. And the first campaign we have launches on April 25th, and this one's called A Tale of Bravery. And this plays one to four players and takes about 40 to 90 minutes to play. And this one is a epic choose your own fantasy adventure where the story is going to be divided into a number of one hour quests. And you're going to be completing goals within a quest book in order to try and complete those quests. Players will be using that quest book as well as exploring a grander map in order to make decisions and decide where their path is going to go. But then as soon as you dive into exploring the different areas of the map, or if you're engaging in combat, you're going to be using modular tiles to build out those areas. And you're going to be putting different enemies as well as your characters out on those maps and then completing skill checks to try and interact with different areas or in order to determine your success if you go to attack an enemy. And there's going to be all sorts of enemies with different stats and abilities and pretty much everything you need to engage in combat with that enemy is provided on that enemy's card. And defeating these different enemies, completing different quests, and making new discoveries will earn you experience points which you can then spend to upgrade your stats or gain new abilities that you can add to your arsenal. That's not the only way you can upgrade your character because you can also gain different items and weapons and you can combine them in all sorts of different ways because you can equip one item to each hand so you could go with two swords, a sword and a shield or something completely different. The game gives you a ton of different options when it comes to building out your character, but there's also going to be a ton of different options with how you decide to progress the story because you could play as noble heroes trying to do everything right and making the most ethical decisions all the time, or you could take a more questionable path choosing to just let the cities burn and then salvage whatever is left over for your own benefit. Of course, every decision you make does have its consequences, and if this one does sound interesting to you, I'll have links in the description below, and you can go ahead and get notified once this campaign launches. 
And the next campaign, also launching on the 25th, is Seismic. And this plays two to six players. It takes about 60 to 180 minutes to play. But this one is a competitive game where each player is trying to be the first to build up their rocket ship and escape a dying planet. This one is also a game that I thought was launching last week, but it got pushed back until this week. So I did already cover this one, and I'll just go ahead and roll that previous footage for you now. And this is a competitive game that takes place on a crumbling planet and players are going to be competing to build their spaceship and be the first to evacuate their people off world. The game plays over a series of rounds where each player is going to get five turns per round and each turn you'll be able to play one unit card or one tactic card in order to perform your actions and the different actions will allow you to recruit different units, manage your economy, fight your opponents and explore and gather resources in order to construct your colony ship. But something that's really interesting about this game is that every single player has something that another player wants because every player only knows how to build one part of their ship and in order to build the other parts of your ship you're either going to have to extort or trade with your opponents in order to convince them to divulge their secrets. And a really nice mechanism here that's going to allow players to get within negotiation distance of their enemies really quickly is that on each side of the board there are arrows of different colors and whenever you leave the board on one of those arrows you'll be able to come in at any other part of the board that matches the color of those arrows. And this is just a nice way to bridge the gap between all the different players so that no matter where you start on the board each of your enemies is roughly the same distance away. And whichever player is able to successfully build the ship first is going to be the one that wins the game. There's no victory points here, so if you are a fan of that, this is one you'll want to check out, and I have links in the description below. Also launching on April 25th, we have Endeavor Deep Sea, and this plays 1-5 to five players and takes about 60-75 to 75 minutes to play. And this is an exploration action selection board game where players are each going to be the head of their own independent research institute. Players are going to be recruiting different divers into their institute in order to unlock new actions that you're going to be using to explore the ocean floor. And if you are interested in this one, I think you can have a lot of confidence backing it because this one is a re-implementation of the very popular game Endeavor Age of Sail. But this one's going to be adding some streamlined rules as well as upgraded artwork. But that's not all because there's also going to be some brand new mechanisms as well, including the brand new scenarios that are going to be introduced. And these scenarios are going to be offering you a whole bunch of different ways to set up the game, along with different rules and goals that are specific to those scenarios. So this is just going to be adding a ton of variety, allowing you to make each game play a little bit different than the last. But that's not all that these scenarios offer because each one's also going to be offering a competitive solo and co-op mode as well. Another thing that's new in this game is that each specialist or diver that you recruit into your own personal action tableau is also going to be upgradable so each one's going to be double-sided and when you do upgrade that specialist you'll be able to flip them over to their more powerful side. This version of the game also features a modular ocean that's going to be built up as you play the game just adding even more variety as different cards show up in your different sessions. And this one is also our discord pick of the week which is not a surprise at all considering how well the original game did and this one's building upon that rule set streamlining it in many ways but then also adding way nicer artwork and new mechanisms that I personally believe only further improve the game and for all those reasons this one is also my own personal pick of the week. But this is a game that plays over six rounds and each player is going to have their own personal player board and each player board is going to have four tracks on it. And at the start of your turn, you're essentially just going to be going through each of those tracks. Your first track is going to allow you to recruit a new specialist into your tableau. But as you move that track up throughout the game, that's actually going to give you more options to choose from when you go to recruit a specialist from the market. Because new columns are going to be moving up as you move that track further to the right. But in order to perform actions with these different specialists, you need to have action tokens that you're going to be placing onto those cards every time you perform that action. And it's the second track that dictates how many new action discs you'll get to pull into your own personal supply. But one thing that's important to note here is that in order to place an action disc onto one of your specialists, it needs to have an action space available on it. And if you've placed a disc on that specialist previously and that disc is still occupying that action space, then that means that you can't use that space until you've recalled that action disc back to your supply. And that's what the third track is for because it's going to dictate how many of those action discs you can recall back into your supply, which is essentially another way to get 
action discs into your supply in order to reuse them. But then it also opens up more of your specialists to be used again, which is going to give you even more options. And these are the three tracks that you're going to be going through one by one at the start of your turn and performing the associated action. But then there is a fourth track that you're also going to be trying to get as far to the right as possible in order to upgrade it. But it doesn't come into play at the start of your turn. Instead, it comes into play when you perform your actions because this is your movement track. And after players have gone through all those tracks and performed the associated actions, then players will be taking turns placing their action discs onto their specialists in order to perform the associated actions of those specialists. And those actions can allow you to do all sorts of different things like moving your ship token along the surface of the ocean and of course the amount that you can move your ship is dictated by that movement track. Wherever you decide to stop you'll gain the arrival bonus for that location but then each of these cards also has other actions associated with it that you can also perform and this is why you want as many of these action tokens as possible because as you're exploring the ocean you're going to get new opportunities to perform actions and in order to perform those actions you have to put action tokens permanently on those locations which could translate to spending a bunch of those action tokens on a single turn as you chain all these actions together. And another action you can perform is to explore more of the ocean, and you can either explore a new column of the ocean by adding a new surface card to the ocean tableau, or you could choose to go deeper into the ocean by drawing cards from that specific depths deck, and then choosing the one that you want to add to the ocean. And these different actions can also gain you a special resource known as research, and if you come across any of these conservation tracks, you can actually spend that resource in order to put your action tokens on these tracks, which is going to gain you all sorts of chains of bonuses. You can also spend your research to gain cards in order to upgrade your actions, gain abilities, or different one-time effects. But that's not all, because as you're playing the game, you're going to be unlocking impact cubes. And whenever you gain one of those, you'll be able to connect it onto the impact track adjacent to an impact cube that you've already placed. And doing this is going to give you ongoing bonuses and victory points at the end of the game, depending on the different paths that you choose. I've never personally played this game, but I have heard a lot of positive feedback from different people in my board game groups, and this one has come up a lot as a suggestion for different game nights. And one of the reasons I've never played this game is probably due to the fact that anytime it came up as a suggestion, I was never one to vote for it. Personally, I found that the original box art and the name of the game just made it seem like it was going to be one of these giant, sprawling exploration games with a ton of rules that would just take forever to play. But after doing the research here to explain this game, I'm kicking myself for never giving this one a shot because this one does look like a ton of fun and I'm very tempted to back it, but I would like to get a game in before I do. So if there is a TTS for this one, and there probably will be, I'll definitely try to give it a go because it doesn't look nearly as complicated as I thought it would be. In fact, it looks very streamlined and honestly, it looks exactly like my type of game. And if you agree, you can find a link in the description below where you can follow to get notified on launch. Also launched on April 25th, we have Guards of Atlantis 2, and this plays 4 to 10 players and takes about 90 to 120 minutes to play. And this is a competitive MOBA style game where each player is going to be controlling their own set of heroes and minions. And the game offers three different ways to win. You can either deplete your enemy's base's health down to zero. And the way to do that is by killing their heroes because each time you kill a hero, you're going to be reducing that enemy's base health by one. Alternatively, you can win the game by being the first player to reach the enemy's base. And the way that that works is that each time that you kill all your opponent's minions within a region of the board, you're going to be gaining ground and pushing forward as the enemy respawns their minions into the region that is next closest to their base. But in theory, this means that you and your enemy could just be pushing each other back and forth until the end of time, which is why there is the third end game condition. And the winner for that one, it simply goes to the player that wins the fifth push, and you can kind of think of that one as a tiebreaker. And the way this game works is that each player is going to be starting out the game with five cards in their hand, and each one of these cards is going to have an initiative value, as well as a primary action and a secondary action. Turns are played simultaneously, with each player choosing a card from their hand to play in secret, and then revealing that card, and then the player that has a higher initiative value is going to be the player that's able to perform their actions first. And whenever you perform an action from these cards, you're going to choose if you want to do the primary action or the secondary action. The primary action is usually a little bit more unique and has some special effects and usually a little bit more powerful, whereas your secondary action is normally just a movement action. 
but every time you use a card, you're going to be putting that card into a slot onto your own personal player board. And once all four slots are filled, that's going to trigger the end of the round. Whenever you attack an enemy unit, you're going to be checking what kind of unit it is, because if it's a minion, it's just going to be killed instantly and you're going to gain a coin for killing that minion. But if you attack a hero, the enemy player has to discard a card with a defense greater than your unit's strength. But if that player is not able to do that, then they don't defend against the attack and their hero is going to be killed, along with losing one health from their base. And once both players have played their four cards or as many cards as they're able to play, that's going to trigger the end of the round, but it also triggers a really cool aspect of the game where you have to spend as much of your coins as possible upgrading the cards that you have in your hand. Because although you only ever have five cards in your hand throughout the entirety of this game and those cards are always reused, you do have the ability to pay to upgrade any of those cards into a stronger version of that card. And each time you upgrade it, you will have multiple options as as to what you want to upgrade that card into. Of course, the card you choose is going to replace the one that you've upgraded, but then the card that you didn't choose is actually going to upgrade the stats of every single card in your hand. And the way that this is indicated is by an icon on the bottom of those cards. And whichever icon that is, that's what's going to be upgraded for sacrificing that card. So this means that the card that you don't pick is also a factor to consider when it comes to upgrading your card. And because of the fact that this game is super easy to teach and play and also gives you a ton of options and also has zero randomness because you're making all the decisions that are going to be affecting you throughout the game. This one is also my personal pick of the week because these are my videos and I can do what I want. I do already own this game, but there is a bunch of packs and upgrade that I could add to my collection as well, which I don't have previously. Not sure if I'm going to back this one yet, but I might just have to play it a couple more times to be sure. But if you're interested in this one, I definitely recommend it. You can check it out in the description below and you can click to get notified. Also launched on April 25th, we have Swirling Heroes, and this is a strategic puzzle card game for up to four players, with each player holding a hand of six cards in their specific player color. Each of these cards is going to have a number on each side, and players are going to be taking turns placing a card into the tableau, and the card can be placed any way that you want here, even upside down. There's just two rules that you have to follow, and that's that long sides have to be placed next to long sides, and short sides have to be placed next to short sides, and the numbers of the adjacent cards cards do have to match. But anytime that a card's placed into the tableau, all the cards adjacent to it are going to flip 180 degrees. And the game continues like this until all the players have placed out all their cards. And then each player is going to be gaining victory points equal to the numbers on the exposed edges of the cards matching their colors. The player with the most victory points wins the game, and if you're interested in this one, you can find links to the campaign in the description below. And also launching on the 25th, we have the continuation of the 18 Hex Games collection. If you're not familiar with this, this is just a collection of games that are completely comprised of 18 hexes. There are three games that were introduced in the original campaign, and this campaign is going to be adding three more to that collection. And the first new addition to the collection is called Flippa, and this plays one to 12 players. It takes about 15 to 30 minutes to play, and this is a word forming game where you're going to be putting the tiles out on the table in front of all the players, and players are going to be taking turns trying to form words from connected tiles. Once you do that, you're going to be gaining a victory point for each tile used in your word, and then you're going to be flipping all those tiles over to reveal different letters on the back. The next player then gets their turn to form a word following the exact same rules, and then the first player that reaches 20 points wins the game. And the next new game that's going to be added to the collection is called Yin Yang, and this plays one to two players, takes about 15 to 30 minutes to play. And in this game, there's going to be a player playing as the yin and a player playing as the yang. And on your turn, you'll be able to activate one of the tiles matching your color. And each tile is going to have a number as well as an element associated with it. You're going to choose whether you want to activate the number or the element, and those are going to have some different effects. And at the end of your turn, you're allowed to take one of your own tiles that matches an element that you control into your own personal supply. And that's going to gain you victory points if you still control that element at the end of the game. This means that you do want to take tiles of the different elements Elements, but you don't want to take too many that it will cost you the control of that element at the end of the game. The game plays for a set number of rounds, and then the player with the most victory points earned by owning tiles of an element that they control is going to be the one that wins the game. 
And the third new game that's going to be added into the mix is called Q Memory. And this plays one of six players and takes about five to 15 minutes to play. And the way this game works is that all of the tiles are going to be laid out onto the table. And then players are going to be taking turns trying to flip tiles, but flipping them in a particular order. And if they're able to complete an entire sequence of tiles in the proper order, then they're going to be the player to win the game. But if they flip any tile wrong, then all the tiles need to be flipped back over to the opposite side, which means that players are going to have to rely on their memory and what tiles were flipped previously in order to try and be the first to flip all the tiles in the proper order. And as I said, I did cover the first three games in this collection during their original campaign, so I'll just go ahead and roll that previous footage for you now, and that'll give you a good idea how all six games play in this Hex game collection. And Pantheon is a two-player head-to-head asymmetric strategy game where one player is going to be playing as Greece and the other player is playing as Rome. Each tile in this game is double-sided with Rome on one side and Greece on the other. But there is one special tile in this game and it's called the coin tile and the thing that makes this tile different is it's the first tile out on the board. And players are going to be taking turns putting one tile out onto the board and each tile in this game is going to have a special ability but the ability never affects itself it always affects another tile either adjacent to it or out on the board. And this can do different things like move tiles around, flip tiles to the other side, or even put some tiles on top of other tiles. Players will gain victory points for each of their visible tiles at the end of the game, and whichever player has their side face up on the coin tile will also gain three points. And then players can also gain victory points equal to the number of tiles that they have in their biggest group of tiles. And after all the tiles are placed, the player with the most victory points wins the game. And the next game, Hextremadura, plays quite a bit differently, where each each of the tiles is going to be broken up into six different sections, and each of the sections can be one of three different terrain types. Each of these tiles are also double-sided, but one side is going to have a basic objective, and then the other one's going to have an advanced objective. And each of the basic objectives is going to have a certain terrain type, as well as a number of sections that need to be joined together in order to complete that objective. The advanced objectives work very similar to this, but instead of the terrain types having to be adjacent to the tile, they can actually be anywhere on the board. And players are going to start with an equal number of tiles and they're going to be taking turns placing tiles out onto the play area. And if you're able to meet the requirements of one or more basic tiles, you'll be able to take those tiles back into your supply, but then flip them to their advanced objective side. And the game just continues with players putting tiles out into the play area. Gaining advanced tiles doesn't change the game in any way. It just gives you another option of tiles to put out onto the board. You'll just really want to be the ones to gain those advanced tiles because then that gives you control of when to put them out onto the board and the advanced tiles are the only objectives that will grant you victory points for the end of the game. After all the tiles are placed you add up your victory points and the player with the most points wins the game. And this third one plays quite a bit different than the previous two and it plays up to three players where the previous two just played up to two players. But the one similarity that this one does have is that it also does have double-sided tiles and in this game one side of the tile is going to be a block of a certain color with a certain identifier on it. And then the other side is just going to have some random objectives. The game starts with all the tiles face up showing the block side and they're all shuffled together into a single draw deck. Three of these tiles are going to be drawn into a supply and then three of them are going to be drawn and flipped to reveal three objectives. And once again, the rules are very simple here. Players are just going to be taking turns choosing a tile from the supply and then replenishing it and then placing that tile into the main play area. Just like with the other two games, you always have to place the tile adjacent to an existing tile. But what you're trying to do here is match up certain tiles together in order to complete the different objectives. And each of the different objectives is going to be asking you to create certain patterns in order to complete that objective. And I know on the surface here that sounds like a very basic way to score victory points. But there is something really clever here that I want to point out. And it's actually so clever, it's kind of difficult for me to explain without using some special images. So I'm going to pull up the rule book and do my best to try and explain exactly how these patterns work. So each of the objectives has some sort of requirement on it, but if you look at these objective cards, they're all 2D, where each of these tiles is actually 3D. And what I mean by that is you want to view these hexes more as cubes, where you can see three sides of each cube. So this diagram on the left here beside the objectives represents what the hexes could look like after they are placed out onto the board. And what you have to do is kind of mentally shift your perspective to just be viewing one side of the cubes at a time. So if you're just looking at the left side, you would see the pattern pattern A, and if you were just looking at the B side, you would see the pattern B, and if you are looking from the top, you would see the pattern C. And I'll just give you a second to look at these and connect the dots and make those connections. You got it? Great.
And if you're able to complete any of those objectives looking at any one of those three perspectives, then you will gain that objective card into your hand, and that's going to grant you victory points at the end of the game. Some of the objectives are more difficult than others, so they are worth more victory points at the end of the game if you are able to complete them, and the player with the most victory points wins the game. So if you're interested in a little collection of travel size games that each play very different from each other, but then also have a really simple rule set with quite a lot of depth, I think this is definitely a campaign to check out. And don't forget, you can click that notify me button from the link in the description below. Also launched on the 25th, we have Gamble. And this plays two to four players and takes about 15 to 25 minutes to play. And this is a push your luck card and dice game that re-implements the game Dynamo. And the games do play very similar to each other with a few minor scoring differences. And I did cover Dynamo when it launched. And like I said, there's not a whole lot of differences here other than the name, small change to the scoring and the artwork change. So I'll just go ahead and roll that previous footage for you now. Just keep in mind those changes. And if you are interested in this one, I do have a link down below. And the way that this game works is that each player is going to get dealt a few different cards and then those cards are going to be revealed face up and any cards that are the same color are going to get paired together into a single stack. But then you're also going to be dealing out a few cards on the table and those also get turned face up and also any cards matching the same color will also get stacked. But the way that this game works is that for each player's turn there's going to be a new card revealed and added to that shared row and then that player can decide if they want to roll the colored die or if they want to roll the numbered die whatever color or number they roll they'll be able to take a matching card from that shared row that matches that color or number but that's not the only option that a player has because instead of just taking one card from that shared row they can instead place the die on one of their own rows in order to make a bet. And sometimes you might just want to do this because there were no matches with your die in the main row. But when you place a die onto one of your stacks, you're essentially making a bet that you're going to roll a value matching one of the cards in that stack. So since this player is betting on their yellow row, they want to roll either a 4, a 6, or whatever is on this third card. If they're able to do that, they'll be able to take any card they want from the shared row, but because the color that they rolled also matches the color that they're betting on, they can actually take a full stack from the shared row. I don't see any stacks there right now, but if there was a stack, then they would be able to take it. But if they made the bet and then rolled the die and didn't match any of the numbers in the stack that they bet on, then they lose that entire stack of cards and it goes into the shared row. So there's a risk here of losing your cards and the really fun thing about that is that your bigger stacks will give you a higher probability of rolling the number that you need, but then also come at a higher cost of losing more cards if you're unable to roll one of those numbers. But the goal of this game is to try and complete an entire stack of a single color and whichever player is able to do that first wins the game. Also launched on the 25th we have Forgotten Depths. This plays one of three players it takes about 45 to 135 minutes to play and this is a cooperative dungeon adventure where players are going to be taking turns drawing dungeon tiles and then placing those tiles into the dungeon following the placement rules that any tiles you place have to connect to the existing paths. Players will continue to do this until they decide to explore the dungeon and at that point you get to to decide together as a team which paths you want to take, which treasure you want to try and gain, and which enemies you might have to fight along the way. Fighting enemies means that you'll be simultaneously revealing their cards along with your cards to see who did the most damage and won that fight. The players will be ultimately trying to connect certain icons together in order to form the legendary paths, and once you've completed three of those you'll be revealing multiple cards at a time which will tell you a bit of flavor text and story. At which point players will be trying to move on to the next level of the dungeon by trying to make their way over to the staircase. Of course this is a dungeon so the staircase isn't going to go unguarded which means that players are going to have to defeat the level's boss at the staircase if they want to move on to that following level. And the game continues like this and if the players are able to complete all levels and complete the story then they win the game and if you're interested to learn more I have links in the description below. Also launching on the 25th, we have Ascendancy, and this plays one to four players and takes about 60 to 240 minutes to play. And this is a 4X game that I couldn't find too much info on, so I'll just give you the best explanation that I can with the info that I have. But this is a fantasy board game where players control one of several royal houses, and you're going to be competing for the throne. The game includes worker placement and area control mechanisms, where players are going to be choosing multiple paths to victory. Players can upgrade their resources and characters, make decisions that affect the narrative, 
and also engage in combat using a JRPG style rock paper scissors mechanism. The game's going to offer multiple modes of play including solo, competitive, and cooperative and also allows players to choose from various strategies and play styles and combat is optional in this game. Unfortunately, that's all the info I have right now, so if you do want to know more, you can check out a link to the campaign, which I will have in the description below. Also launching on the 25th, we have the next game from the Red Joker, and this one's called Alter Realms of the Gods. And this plays two to five players and takes just 30 minutes to play. And this is a competitive game where each player is going to have their own god, and each player is trying to win the game by finding and activating all of their god's altars and also building at least one shrine. Players are going to be drawing a hand of cards from the main deck, and then on your turn, you'll be able to use those cards to perform actions. And some of the options here are just to discard a card to use its action. Or instead you can choose to discard three cards that each have a ritual symbol in order to build a shrine which as i said is required to win the game or instead you could choose to play a worship card and whenever you do that you're going to be placing it somewhere adjacent to your god and that's going to defend your god and can also cause some other effects and it's all these different cards that will allow you to activate your altars, but you're also going to want to think about defending them because the other players will be able to sabotage your altars and destroy the ones that you've built. So you will have to think strategically with the cards that you play while you anticipate the cards that your opponent might play if you want to be the first player to complete all your altars and win the game. And of course, if you want to know more about this one, I have links in the description below. That's it for this week, but don't leave yet because we still have a couple awesome giveaways to announce and these are the easiest giveaways to enter ever. All you have to do is leave a comment down below. And the first giveaway is for a pledge for Paperback the 10th Anniversary as well as Typewriter. And this is actually a campaign that I missed during the week of its launch. It happens sometimes, but the publisher was still nice enough to donate a pledge for giveaway. Thanks so much for that, and I will try to do a decent job explaining how these games play now, since obviously a ton of people are excited about this one since the campaign's already raised over $135,000. Both of these games are word games, so if you are a fan of word games, you'll definitely want to check these out because I already looked into both of them and they both look like a ton of fun. And the first one I'll explain is Paperback the 10th Anniversary, and this is actually a deck building word game. So each of these cards is going to have letters on them, and you're going to be starting out with a starter deck, but throughout the game you're going to be adding more cards into that deck. But every round you're going to be drawing a few of these cards into your hand and then trying to form a word from those cards. Most of the cards will just be letters, but some of these cards can also have some special effects or even have multiple letters on a single card. They'll be trying to form the longest word as possible to use up all these letters because each card you use is going to add some more points to your score, but some of the effects of some of these cards will also present alternate scoring opportunities that you might also want to try and take advantage of. But another really interesting aspect of this game is that it also offers a solo or cooperative mode where you're going to be laying out all these different cards that you are trying to purchase throughout the game with the goal of trying to acquire the card in the center. In this mode, there's also going to be an AI enemy that's going to be moving around on these cards, placing cubes, and if that enemy places too many cubes out on these cards, then you will lose the game, but there are some ways that you can mitigate that. And in this mode, you also have an action sheet that has a bunch of actions, each associated with a different number on a die, and also each associated with an action that the AI enemy is going to do. At the start of each round, you're going to be rolling a die, and whatever value is rolled, you're going to be covering up the action associated with that number. That means that you are not able to use that action on this turn, but it also indicates which action the AI enemy is going to do after your turn so that you can prepare for it. And just like in the competitive version of this game, you're going to be drawing a hand of cards from your deck and then trying to form words which will earn you money that you can then spend to buy more cards to add to your deck or that you can spend to try and purchase these cards to eventually get to that center card. And anytime on your turn, you can perform one of the actions that isn't covered by the die. And that's usually going to give you some way to navigate around these cards, purchase these cards or deal with the enemy. Now let's get to the second game, which is Typewriter. And the way that this game works is that each player is going to have their own set of starter tokens, which are going to be in this light blue color. But then every round, you'll be able to draft one more letter into your supply, and each of these tokens are double-sided. They can either have other letters on the other side that can gain you victory points if you're able to use them in a word, or they could have some special effects. 
whenever you draft one of these tokens, they always start on the side that has the normal letter on it, not the special ability. But when you are able to use them to complete a word, you're going to be flipping them to the other side. And if you're able to use all your starter letters to complete a word, that's going to trigger scoring. But as I said, you can also score points by taking advantage of the special abilities or the special letters that you might uncover throughout the game. There's also neutral letters that all players can use freely in their words, but these are going to go back to the neutral supply after you've used them, unless you are the first to create words over eight letters long. And if you're able to do that, you actually get to keep that shared letter as your own for the rest of the game. And the game continues like this with you gaining new tokens every round, spelling words in order to flip those tokens over to reveal their special abilities, and then using those special abilities in conjunction with spelling words in order to score victory points. And this giveaway is going to be for the Deluxe Pledge. And to enter this giveaway, all you have to do is leave a comment down below and you can say anything you want. But if you want to have a little fun, I'm going to randomly generate eight letters here and just leave in your comment any word that you can form using any of these eight letters. And we don't have a single vowel there, so let's try that again. So we have P-L-S-F-X-G-I-T. Feel free to see if you can make the longest word here, and I will allow reusing letters multiple times. Good luck in the giveaway, but now let's go ahead and draw the winner for last week's giveaway. And this one was for Flutter, which you can check out on Kickstarter now. But this one was for the Wooden Pledge, which gets you the game entirely in wood, as well as all unlocked stretch goals. And to draw a winner, I use this fancy application here. All these extra names down here are bonus entries for my Patreon subscribers. If you do like this content and you want to help make all these efforts just a little bit more sustainable for me, I do appreciate it and I do have my Patreon linked down below. Let's go ahead and draw those comments and draw the winner. And the winner is... David Humphrey, and this is one of our Patreon subscribers. So I'll reach out to you and let you know that you won yourself a pledge for Flutter. Congratulations on the win. And that's everything for this week. And I will be trying to make a big push on getting caught up on all my emails and private messages and things like that. So if you have been reaching out to me, I will respond. I always do. It just sometimes takes a while. I'm usually always super busy with work and it's been no exception these past couple weeks. Plus, I've been trying to buy a house, so I've been looking at houses during the day and then crying myself to sleep at night when I see what they actually sell for. But I will try to make a little push this weekend and get caught up on all my outstanding messages and emails. So as always, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, keep that shelf cluttered and the table full.